Hi, welcome everybody. We'll be starting in just a couple of minutes. Eric, I know we have quite a few other folks signed up. Should we give them another minute or would you like me to introduce you and would you like to begin? Um, I, uh, how many people? I don't know. Yeah, I guess you can, I, we can start, I think. Sounds great. Thank you everybody for joining us. Eric Bergren is a New York City based artist, costume designer, and costume maker. He graduated from the IDP MTT training program, and I was really excited when Manaslu sent me the email saying that Eric's work was being displayed in New York. That got me talking to him. We had a lovely conversation. Um, so Eric had first started out by working and sewing foam puppets in a puppet shop. Uh, he later went on to join Broadway and to do uh, costumes that specialized in historical replicas. Um, now where Eric has sort of evolved in his creative journey and expression is to make fiber sculptures, wearable fiber sculptures as tall as seven feet. Um, his work has been displayed in galleries and museums all over, uh, from the State Historical Museum in Moscow to the Society of Arts and Crafts in Boston. And most recently, his work is being presented at Zasten in the lobby, as well as his video, which we're gonna get a chance to see today, is on the corner of 7th Ave and 41st Street. Eric, am, am I right about that? Correct. Okay, awesome. Welcome, Eric. We're so excited to have you. Thank you so much for coming and organizing the sharing of your wisdom and your creative expression. We're really grateful. Thank you. Yeah, I really appreciate this. This is cool. I, 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 I'm I, digging it. Um, hi, guys. I'm Eric. <clears throat> uh, that was the introduction that I don't need to say anymore, so that's good. But I'm gonna give you a breakdown on what's gonna happen because it's only an hour and a half. And if I'm gonna talk about my practice and give a practice and watch a video and do a Q and A and all that stuff, we have to like, I just have to be kind of organized about it. So yeah, exactly. So I'm gonna talk for like 25, 30 minutes about what I do, what, why I do it and also, how you can bring your spiritual practice and art practice, uh, you can collide them and use your art practice to develop your spiritual practice, which I have been at least trying to do, whether it comes across, I guess that's up for you to decide, but that's my whole basis in making my art. That's my art practice, basically. And so they collided at some point, but I'm gonna give a talk for 25, 30 minutes on that. And then from about 7.30 to eight, we're gonna actually do the eight dissolutions meditation. It should take half an hour about. <clears throat> and then from eight to 8.15, I'm gonna talk about my project, which is the eight dissolutions, 
which is at the gallery now. And then we'll, if anybody has any questions, we'll do it at the end. Um, and I know I, I switched that around, but I was thinking that I, you know, my project, The Eight Disillusions, that's at the gallery now. I don't want you to really, I mean, maybe you've seen it before, but I don't want you, I don't want to go into uh, detail about it until you've actually done the practice, because then you'll be thinking about what I did and not what comes natural to you. So anyway, that that that's what we're going to do for, and then we'll end it if anybody has any questions. <clears throat> so uh, like it was mentioned, I started off in my, uh, I have a costume background, so it kind of derived, all my work has derived from that, and at some point it got bigger and I started to do different stuff, and then it just kind of became off the body, and then it became more sculptural, and then I got into all sorts of different actual like fiber craft uh, uh, techniques like weaving and coiling and felting and um, that kind of informed my spiritual practice, which started, I don't even know how long ago, maybe 10 or 15 years ago with yoga, actually like physical uh, asanas kind of yoga. And I remember I went on a road trip. I drove to Florida with my best friend, Andrew at the time. And I drove for like 24 hours straight. And I remember when we got there, I was sitting on a poolside and my body was like so twisted up from just like being in the car like this for so long that I remember sitting on a pool and being like, if I don't do something with my physical body, I feel like I'm going to die. And I know that sound, it's, it's dramatic. It is, it's, it wasn't going to happen, but I felt like this immense kind of pressure to like I had to do something about it. And it was just this amazing realization that lit a fire under me, really. So when I came back, I took, I was, you know, I was like, oh yeah, yoga, yoga is the way to do it. So I came back and I took a yoga class every single day for like eight months straight. I mean, like seven days a week. I was so rigorous about it. <clears throat> and I experienced, there was a point, you know, a couple months in that, like, I just was in such bliss and I've never experienced anything like that before. Um, it, 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 I mean, it was weird. It was like a, another level of subconscious that I was like, there's something more that exists here on a, uh, on another level, because I felt like um, I don't know, something opened up in my body and I was just completely, I was completely blissful. So I knew that there was a deeper level and I had the, a yoga teacher that I was following had, would do meditation for like five minutes before the class. And so that's how I sort of got into a sitting practice was really, um, through him teaching that. And then at some point, someone that I was working for, an artist that I was working for was going on this 10 day Vipassana retreat, which I had never heard of, but it's the 10 day or where it's actually, it's like 12 days, but 10 days of actual, um, you're actually there. And then you leave and come back on the first and last. And it's 10 to 12 hours a day of meditation. Uh, it's silent the whole time. There's no reading or writing. They take everything away from you. It's you, they tell you to not even look at people. You eat, I think, at uh, 6 a.m. and then 11 a.m. and then that's it for the day. And it's just really, 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 you wake up at four, which was not normal for me. And I, I had heard of it from her and it kind of like struck this chord, like, oh my God, that's so amazing. I would never do that. But she came back, she told me about it and it I, it completely made me like, it, I, I knew I, I knew I was going to do it at some point. So about a year later, I, I went and I did it and it was the hardest thing I've ever done. It was really tough. And she had said that she came out of it and she was like in bliss for like a month, which I was hoping that didn't happen. And it, and it totally did not, did not 
but it really planted a seed. And I started really researching different aspects of Buddhism and going to different centers and taking like tons of weekend retreats and seminars and reading everything that I can and finding all these teachers. And I was still like, not getting something from it. So at the same time, I was always making my own stuff and working with my art practice. And at some point, these two collided. And what when they my first big project where the actual first and you know, these two things really kind of met was called Shadow Work, which is this book. And I, I finished it in like 2017 and I showed it in 2018. <clears throat> it took me like four or five years. But basically shadow work was, I had a, a moment and it, a realization at the retreat where I realized that I was completely putting myself through my own mental hell basically every day by perpetuating these negative thoughts over and over and over and over. And my way, shadow work was basically my way of trying to work through that. So the whole project were these, they're like seven feet and they were a, um, you know, it took me four years of doing it. So every time I would make a piece, I would focus on what that, what it what it was that I needed to work out. So there are nine pieces. Each one is a different part of the story. Sorry, I'm going to go through. So this one was the first three are basically about the um, the opening of the ritual. So this is the one where the candles are lit. These are candles coming down. <clears throat> and then the second one, it's the sage, the uh, dusting of the sage. So these are these are rituals, and they're the first three are just about preparing to it, preparing to actually get to the work. And this is the third one, which is called begin. And this is uh, like one inch strips of fabric that are wrapped in thread and then sewn into these three D shapes. And that's a Tibetan singing bowl in the middle. And then the fourth one was all about, this one was basically the key to the riddle on how to get out of this trap of reinforcing these negative thoughts over and over until I die and born again to do, to do the same, which is the cycle of what they call samsara, but really it's your own negative hell. So this one, I'll get back to why this was so important. I'm trying to see, my like what I'm showing at the same time. So this is the one where the body is cut open and all of this junk is inside and getting ready to be exposed as soon as everything begins. And this one, it's all woven. It's jute rope that's all woven. I had to build a loom that was like a hundred inches tall to get, because I didn't want there to be any seams in this whole thing. And it's really, really tall. And then that's the face. But this piece is called Juanita, and I'll get back to why at the end. And this one, it's like a, it's called the crematorium, but it, this is all, it's a big woven structure, if you can see it. And the top is all coiled. And that's, that's when after the body split open and all that stuff is inside, you're, it comes out and you're basically burning in your own thoughts. And this one is called cocoon, the cocoon. And these, this is all reed that's woven. And so this is the part where after you're burning in it, you're, com you're completely solidified and it's trapped, trapped in your own hell basically <clears throat> and the last three pieces were dedicated to the rainbow body which is in a really amazing buddhist phenomenon in which at the time of death if you become enlightened your body explodes into rainbow light 
And it's supposed to be this thing that has happened to, you know, high llamas when they've been burned. And I did a, I did a, a, a 10 day retreat in a monastery in Nepal called Kopa, Kopan Monastery. And they have this room that they took us in at the end <clears throat> that was, there's all these glass cases. And when they burn these monks who this has happened to, they, you know, they burn them. And then the next day they go back and in the ashes, they leave pearls. They're called relics. They're like little pearls. And all of the little pearls are on display in these glass cases in the specific room and they grow every year. So they have like the measurements, they're on these pillows and they have the measurements that they started out with. And every year they have the measurements and whether you buy it or not, it's, it was still really, really amazing to see. But these last three pieces are about the rainbow body phenomenon. And so these are all woven with reed. And in my story, the rainbow body gets black you can see it's black on the bottom. And that's the disappearing of the rainbow body one. This is the disappearing of the rainbow body two, which gets even blacker. And you can see the mummy inside. And this is all woven with reed. And then we get to the last one, which is only black. The threads are only black. So the way I displayed these was in a circle with dirt all around. And you walked in and you, you know, there it was a pretty small room and you were they were kind of towering over. <clears throat> and so you were confronted by these things. And it's this whole idea of reinforcing these negative thoughts over and over and over you know it's it's sitting down getting ready to getting ready to dive deep realizing that you're doing this to yourself having it be completely consumed and then everything that's good is completely being sucked away you're you die and then you're born again and do it the same and it's the cycle of doing it over and over and over and that's the creation of your own mental hell. But I'm going to leave you with a little encouragement, which is this one. <clears throat> so I went to Peru. I, I think it was like either when I was making this or right after. Oh no, it was it was it was right before. And there is this museum in a place called Arequipa called. Um, it's a museum dedicated to this one mummy called Juanita. And basically when you go to this museum, it's so cool. It's a very kind of small museum, but they show you the video about like how Juanita became where, you know, how they found her. And basically they found her in the seventies and, uh, or the nineties maybe, <clears throat> but she, she was dead for a really long time. And she was sacrificed. She was chosen at a really young age to be sacrificed when she was from age 12 to 14. And so they took her on the, they took her up the, the Andes for three days and they put her on the top of a mountain and hit her on the head with a rock and she was sacrificed. So she knew from age zero to 12 or 14 or whenever she died that she was going to die. And so that was basically the key to getting out of this is I feel, you know, when you have this, what, 10 years of knowing you're going to die, you can use it in two ways. You can either be completely insane with fear being like, oh my God, like I have to do this now because I don't have that much longer to live or you can be completely liberated. Like nothing matters because you're gonna die. It does, nothing matters. And so she had 10 years, but in the grand scheme of the universe, our hundred years means nothing, you know, it goes like that. And so this idea of 
knowing you're going to die was really the way to get out of this cycle over and over and over. And when I went to go see this museum, you know, you go in, you see the video and then you go look, it's really dark in there. And you go look at all these objects that she was buried with, like bowls and, and uh, different tapestries and stuff like that. And then they take you in this room, they part the curtain, they take you in this room. It's really dark. Your eyes have to adjust for a second. And then there's this ice box and she's like curled up laying there. And I was so struck by that. It was so striking. And I didn't realize why. And I was keeping a journal and it took me like a bunch of days to realize exactly that. And I was like, that really is the way to get out of this is knowing that it's not going to be, you're not going to be there for very long. <clears throat> and so after when I, before, right before I made this, this was the first time that my spiritual practice had kind of collided in a real way with my art practice. And I, you know, I have found all these teachers that really broke things down on a really logical, really practical level that, you know, it, it was not airy and it was not mystical like I've heard so many times in the past it was just this is the mind it is a non-physical thing these are these are what kind of thoughts you can have you can have positive negative and neutral thoughts forget the neutral just focus on the positive and negative the negative are actually advent they call adventitious which just means they could be removed and so the kind of baseline is positive emotions and or positive thoughts and that's what equals happiness. And all the negative is the stuff that you've practiced in the past in order to, that has, that's the only reason you have them is because you practiced in the past. So it's like your mind is H2O, water, and then all of this stuff that has been added, which is the negative thoughts are pollution and can be removed. And when I heard this and that you can develop your mind into such a place that there's nothing that comes up that you don't want to be there, that was always my goal. I mean, I became like kind of obsessed with that, you know, and I love the discipline about it, you know, and that all of these negative thoughts, the baseline is fear. The, the root of them is fear. And then you could rip the negative out using that fear. And I love, <clears throat> did anyone, anyone see that documentary about Nina Simone? And it was so good because I, I love Nina Simone and I never knew kind of any of that stuff about her. And she was so angry. She was so angry because she was fighting for black rights in the sixties and she, you know, she had to move to Africa at one point because she was, she was like overcome by her anger, but you would never know that because when you listen to her voice, it's so soft and angelic and gentle and beautiful, but there's so much anger there. I would, I was completely actually pretty shocked and felt kind of ignorant that I never knew that, but she said, they asked her, what do you think freedom is? And she said, it's a really good clip, but she's like, I'll tell you what freedom is. No fear, no fear. And when I get on that stage and I play, I don't feel fear. And that's because she's a wizard, you know? She's able to take that anger, that, overwhelming sense of anger and transmute it into this like soft, beautiful, angelic music. And that's real wizardry. You know, that's, that's alchemy. That's turning something that's garbage into gold. And that's always been my kind of way of going about doing my work, not to compare myself to Nina Simone at all, but it's always been the goal to do that and really kind of dive deep in myself, find exactly, you know, first you have to sort your mind out and our mind right now is like, you know, I'd, I'd love the, the example of 
it's like a soup, you know? And then it's not like minestrone where there's like, oh, there's a carrot and there's a celery. It's like a puree and everything is mixed together, all the junk. And you have to really sort out what's positive and what's negative and what's neutral. And, and that's when, you know, you do that by meditation. And that's when you can really rip the root negative out. And so I, that's where, you know, that's where shadow work came from was my way of really trying to take it and rip it out. So, like I said, the Juanita piece was my way of really zoning in on how to solve all of that, get out of that cycle. And from there came the Eight Disillusions. So the Eight Disillusions is a Buddhist death process that when you die, <clears throat> the senses and the elements shut down in eight different stages. So number one is earth and sight. Number two is water and hearing, et cetera, et cetera. So when COVID happened in January uh, or in March, I, I was working at a show and I quit in January because I really wanted to work on this project. And then COVID happened and then, you know, which was really coincidental because there was death everywhere and there was like more trucks on 14th street. I mean, you couldn't sign on anything without seeing, you know, people that, you know, I don't know, death was all around. So it was really hard to do this, but at the same time, it was like a really good time to do this. So before I talk about my project or my, you know, dive into the eight disillusions, I want to give the actual practice so you can get a glimpse of what it's about. So everyone lie down. And get really, really comfortable. Because if you have any distractions, <clears throat> Um, it, it, you know, it takes away from it. So this is a visualization and I'm going to lead you through it. Your eyes are going to be closed the whole time. Some people have trouble with visualizations in the fact of they try to make things up or fabricate things, but really try to make this your first thought, best thought. Don't imagine stuff. Don't get carried away having your mind trail off. Really try to incorporate feeling, thought together. So mind and body together. So lie down. <clears throat> You really get settled, really, really, really get settled. For, so where you you're un, you you you're not able to move, or you are capable of not moving for the next thirty minutes or so, and feel your feel yourself underneath your head and behind your face and in the body. And feel your hands. Any sensation that's happening in your hands, whether it's tickling or heat or pressure, and feel your feet. And have the motivation 
that you're doing this in order to make your life more meaningful and your death more meaningful. That is why you're doing this practice. And imagine this is the best version of how you want to die. It's the kind of bed you want to die in. You're at the age you want to die. Picture this as the case. You've told all your family how much you cared about them, that you enjoyed every second of your relationship with them, how much you love them. All of those conversations have been had. And you've forgiven everyone you needed to forgive. You asked forgiveness of everyone you needed to ask. And you've also dealt with all your belongings, all the things you wanna to go to your friends and your family have been organized. If you gave them to charity, they have them and you really have a sense of relief that you don't have any of that anymore and that they will go on to completely benefit other people. So as you feel yourself get heavier and heavier, the earth, you're sinking in the earth more and more. You're no longer able to open your eyes. The body becomes very thin and very loose. There's an experience of being buried under the earth or sinking into the earth, heavier and heavier. It's an inner experience. It isn't happening externally. It's an inner experience, sinking down, sinking, sinking, heavier, heavier. Your eyes, what they call the eye consciousness, which see shape and color, slowly dissipates, slowly disappears. Until you can no longer open your eyes. In your vision, your internal vision is like water on a desert horizon. The body is no longer able to experience the three type of feelings, pleasure, pain, and neutral. All of them become one. It's no longer able to feel these. You are no longer able to feel. Feel that stillness. Understand that stillness. 
as the fluids from the body begin to dry up, sweat, urine, saliva, You're starting to have difficulty swallowing. As the ear sense power starts to go and you can no longer hear sounds, really feel that ear close up so you're no longer able to hear. The only thing you could hear is my voice. Don't lick your lips. The lips are drying up, starting to get chapped. You start to see smoke puffing up into the air. You're no longer able to recognize objects in their actual form. If your friends and family were there, you would forget their names and not be aware of them. The fire element, the heat from the body starts to go and the body begins to lose its warmth. The nose deteriorates, the nose sends power, and you can no longer smell. Your inhalation starts to get weak and the exhalation starts to get stronger. as the nose deteriorates. The breathing starts to speed up, almost like a panting. And you start to see sparks, fire funneled up through a chimney, sparks, flying in the night sky. The body gets, is no longer able to move. The connections between your brain able to move your fingers is no longer the air element starts to dissolve. The wind and all the energy from the body slowly comes to a halt and your breathing stops. No pulse. If you were in a hospital, you'd be clinically dead. really feel that 
what that would feel like. Stillness. The tongue starts to become thick and short and curls up. Taste is lost. And the tongue that spent its life gossiping is no more. You start to see red and blue flame of a candle sputtering, flickering as it slowly starts to burn out. In your gross consciousness, which is how we operate on a daily basis, all of the elements that add to how you can move the way you move are gone and you're no longer able to function. You're dead. The mind, the mind is a thing that keeps going. The mind, the non-physical mind that is different than the physical brain, the mind. Subtle consciousness, gross body. Your gross is how you operate. Your day-to-day -day body is gone. Subtle forms start to get revealed. Any kind of gross conceptuality is gone and your vision gets white. White sky. You feel a white drop on the crown of the head. The white drop comes down through a central channel to the heart center where your working heart once was. The white sky, everything gets white. Now the red drop, as your vision is still white, the red, visualize a red drop at the navel and then begins to rise up towards the heart. As redness overtakes the white until it's pure red the red sky, a vast vacuum of red.
this red drop. slowly gets darker. Slowly gets darker. Slowly gets darker. Until it turns black. Complete blackness and all thought stops. The vision of the black sky, all thought stops. Stops. Know what that feels like as it stops. All thought stops. Stops. No thoughts, all thought stops. And as you slowly become conscious again, visualize a clear, luminous, which means non-physical, vacuum-like, empty sky, complete, clear, open, radiant faculty. And for Buddhists who understand what emptiness, about emptiness, this is where your moment that you really understand emptiness comes in. It's not empty space, but the emptiness of the object of negation. There is no sensation of color. It is an extremely subtle, clear light with an extremely subtle mind. Stay in the space. Open, clear. Float in this space. Understand emptiness. As you feel yourself slowly back, slowly back, back into the blackness where no thoughts, slowly back until everything turns red. Feel what that felt like when you were in that red sky state.
and the red turns back to white. Your tongue slowly starts to get sensations inside your mouth. You're breathing. You're now able to breathe more and more. As your body gets warmer, and warmer, your smell starts to come back. As you feel the moist skin, the water element in the body starts to flood back. Your hearing starts to come. As you start to get lighter and lighter, Your eye consciousness is now able to look at your closed eyelid and understand that the eyes are closed as the body gets lighter. And you're you can feel your fingers as the consciousness comes back to the body. more and more as you can take a deep breath and slowly open the eyes and come back in the room. So, I first learned that meditation at the same monastery I did a, a retreat at in Nepal, Kopan. And I just, I mean, we did that whole retreat. We did all uh, visualizations, <clears throat> which was new for me because I was, you know, I had been going to these Vipassana, uh, I've been going to these Vipassana retreats, which are not at all visual. And I kept going back to these 10 dayers and, and, you know, I wasn't in, when is an into visualization. So <clears throat> it took me not very long at all to really understand the value of it. I really, really, really think that they're like so juicy. And especially this one, when we did it, I was completely like, oh, I got to do that one over and over because I, I got so much from it. So, and I just mean visuals. I mean, it's really, you get a lot. It was, it was interesting and like joy. I was, I was having fun basically doing it. So I wanted to dive even deeper into it and this idea that all of these great lamas could understand you know have developed their mind into a place that 
nothing comes up that they don't want to be there. This was part of my way of getting to that place. So I really wanted to make this project, number one, because it forced me to do this meditation over and over and over. <clears throat> and also because I really was interested in seeing where, what I can get from it and like what I can develop from it and what kind of insights into life after death or whatever comes after death I would be able to get. And it ended up being something else. You know, I didn't get literal answers. But the death state is said to be the closest to the dream state. And when you practice, I have a lucid dream practice, which is to realize you do all these, you do all these real things during the day. They're called reality checks to get you to realize that you're dreaming when you're dreaming. So when you're dreaming, you can, you know, do these different practices that will make you realize, oh my God, I'm in a dream. And then you can, you're in your subconscious when you're doing that. So you can, you know, if you're having trouble with a project, you can ask someone around you that's in the dream, or you can just call it out in the air. You can bring up my favorite is to bring up childhood trauma. So you can just be like childhood trauma, come forward, show yourself. And something will come in the form of that. And it's this tangible thing that you can actually confront that's deep in your subconscious. And it's, yeah, I mean, it's like scary in like uh, a figurative state, but there's it's a dream. You you cannot get hurt, so it's a really good way to, you know, you I spend these retreats like like a hundred hours digging and digging and digging and digging, trying to get to the subconscious so I can see what's in there, so I can get it out of there, and you know the things that I don't want to be there. And lucid dreaming, you can go there every night and confront these things. So anyway, the dream state is the closest to the death state. So while I was doing my lucid dream practice, I was practicing this and you know, trying to kind of collide them basically. So now that you have your own interpretation of what uh, the eight disillusions is, this was my number one which was earth and sight. So this one is like, what I pictured was, and I did this over and over. So it's, it's different when you do it over and over. And when I was trying to develop, I, you know, I was trying to design, I guess, number one, I would focus, I would do the eight disillusions meditation, but I would really zone in on number one. <clears throat> this was number one which is earth and sight. So this is like 300 or 50 something strips of linen that are woven in this kind of mummy pattern. And then the skirt is all felted. And then, you know, the blindfold. So when the, I displayed these, they were first made and then I displayed them at the Morris Museum in New Jersey. They all had, you can see, they all had heads on them on display. <clears throat> I made heads for them and then they had the bodies. But we, when we made the video, we shot them on real people. So these are stills from the, the video. So that's number one. So it's the earth element dissolves and sight starts to go. And as I was doing this over and over the meditation, my, I always noticed that because I would do it laying down, but then I would do it sitting up. My hands always started to move. I always started to kind of move and it became very what I know as buto. You know, it's just this like, Kind of, and, you know, I wasn't like, I was alone. I wasn't showing off for anyone. So I wasn't like trying to, ooh, you know, I was, my hands just really wanted to go in specific positions. So each piece is of the eight disillusions is associated with a sculpture piece, but also associated with a mudra, which is my, the way my hands wanted to go. So a mudra is just like a hand gesture, you know, this is a mudra. And also a sound. So I make drums. So that drum behind me, the that that is the sound for this piece. So it goes. So when we were doing the video, the soundtrack for the video is as we're showing piece one, that sound happens, piece two, that's not, and then you know, until we get to the eight, all the sounds are on top of each other. 
So I took the um, mudras, I photographed someone making them, and then I printed them on fabric, and I made them into dresses that hang behind each of the pieces in the museum as like a shadow. So the, in my video, I had a Bhutto dancer and she modeled the dresses for me. The, these are her actual arms, they're behind her back. So the dresses are like, they look like that with the hands on them. So that's number one. <clears throat> number two was water and sound. So this is number two. I know it's hard to see, these are all on my website. So what happens is positive and negative emotions become neutral at the neck. This is a material that's made from a compressed bark tree that I embedded the fossils in. And then these are all, they make the sound of water as you're going down and they're wrapped with uh, wax thread. That's that green color. That's when you combine all the fluids of the body you get that color. And then they're wearing a drum headphones because that is sound. <clears throat> and then this is the mudra for it. So in the hand are these shakers that make the sound. So that's mudra two. This is three, which is fire and smell. So this is made up of all of these are, it's like couch piping basically that's wrapped in roving, which is uh, sheep's wool, like loose sheep, black sheep's wool, wrapped in thread and then sewn on these 3D, you know, I make these understructures and then it's sewn on that. And this is a drum and then smell is this one. So that's number three. And the mudra for this is that. Number four, air and taste was this one. So this is all felted. These are the lungs. And then the red and blue candle flame burning out and taste. And then you're unable to move. That's number four, our hands are bound. Number five, the radiant white sky, the white drop from the top goes down to the central channel which is a drum triangle. And this is the same, it's like strips of piping that are wrapped in threads and wrapped in sheep's wool. That's the radiant white sky. And this is the mudra for that. The radiant, the red sky, which is this. So here's where I started to get a little technique-y. Uh, when I made this, my studio sort of became my lab because there were no, there was no materials for what I was like envisioning because it's such a bizarre, you know, thing that I was, you know, there, I couldn't go to mood and buy these materials. <clears throat> so I was making a lot of the materials, like all of these are, you know, this is all felted. A lot of that is, I was making all the textiles. With this one, the mind starts to get a little surreal so I knew that there were no textures I was able to do for this. So I started to grow them. So the last, whatever, when the mine goes off or grown. So this brown, and you'll see it more, watch the video, you can see it. It's all made from, and what's under here, it's all kombucha leather, which is like, it's the same way you make kombucha, which is tea, water, sugar, and scobies, which are the things that ferment the tea to make the kombucha. The scobies develop a layer on top to protect themselves. And that's the layer you feed and you can dry it. And it be, it's so cool. It becomes this leather-like material that you can pleat and I sewed it and did all this stuff with it. So that's that. And then this is all reed, which is like a thin bamboo that's woven. And then it has a piece of, has, uh, I covered it with uh, chiffon and then painted it all with silicone because I was picturing this like really wetness. And also the, the, you'll hear the sounds, I didn't go over them, but the sounds for this one is shh. I make all the sounds in the video. And that's the shh is the rising of the kombucha, like sped up shh. And then the is the weaving, which is the body of this. So this is the, the mudra for this.
is the hands. This one for me was always really tense and was like the red, you know? <clears throat> so that's why I did that. And also the red drop from the navel goes up to the heart center where it becomes red and white. And these are drums. This one was my black sky. So this is all woven. My friend, Cynthia Alberto from Weaving Hand, who's on here now, hi Cynthia, wove this for me. And these and these are all crystals and I grew the crystals on there. So it's this like, you make an understructure and dip it a couple of times in a solution and the crystals grow. It's really, really cool. So I, you could see it in the video a lot more. And this is the crack. That's all crystals as well. And then this guy has a bell on his head because that's the sound associated with number seven. So it's the black, that's my black sky. And this is the mudra for it. And then my last one was emptiness. So this is the one that the arms are here and they come out and the mudra for it is this, praying hands at the center. So this is all a textile I made from seaweed. So it's, it's sodium alginate, glycerin, and water that are poured over sheep's wool and then sprayed with calcium chloride. I know it's a lot of chemicals, but it comes into this like paper-like substance. It's so cool. And then I painted it with silicone. So that's all of this stuff. And then these, this is quartz. And then all of these, this is all felted. This is all bismuth, which is, it comes in a silver block and you can melt it down and dip other metals to it. And it crystallizes in these like beautiful, really bright colors. It's so amazing. So I melted all the bismuth down and dipped all this metal into it. And that's what makes the charms. So that was, that was my eight disillusions. And then I originally, I made it and then it went to the Morris Museum in Jersey. And it was from January till uh, June, June. <clears throat> and now it's over at this, it's on display at this gallery called Zaz 10, which is in Times Square next to Champ Sports. And then the video, there's a video component to it, was on, um, like mentioned earlier, on 41st and 7th. It, the, that was the last week, last weekend was the last weekend for it. But they were playing clips of it for the four weeks on the one of the big screens. And then the show is displayed in the gallery. So I'm gonna show you the video um, and let me know if this is working as a screen share. Uh, is this working? It is, right? Okay, can you hear the sound too? You can't. Not getting sound. Let me try to, uh, let me try to do it the other way. Share screen. Should I try, Eric? How about now? Hold on. Can you hear it?
So that was pretty low res. I don't know why it came out like that, but that was a video that was part of the, the show and is on display now. It's also in the gallery space. You can see it. <clears throat> and um, I mean, I could send it around so you can actually see it in its proper form. It was in its, you know, when it's not so low res, but I don't know why it showed up like that. <clears throat> But that's um, on display until September eleventh, uh, tenth. It's we we say tenth, but I think it's going to be there for a day or two after. So yeah, go see it. And does anybody have any questions or comments or anything about today? You can just speak out if you do. Hi, I'm Helen. Hi, Helen. I, you know, I wanted to say that this has been incredibly, incredibly like moving and inspiring. Mm -hmm. When I saw it come through the email and I saw the work, I was immediately drawn to it. And as it connects to practice, I, I'm a creator, painter, maker, but I never really connect my work. It's all a practice, but I don't really connect it to my practice. 
my, my spiritual Buddhism. And um, seeing this opened a portal in me that is very, very, very um, deep. So I wanna thank you for that. The work is incredibly beautiful and hearing the materials that you use um, and that you create and grow out of a SCOBY that just blew my mind. Um, thank you. I mean, it just is fantastic and melting bismuth. Like, I didn't even know you could melt it. It seems so, you know, not met meltable. Um, and then the sound on top of everything else, it really is an incredibly rich experience. And thank you for bringing it to this, you know, little Zoom thing because I felt changed just by seeing the work and that meditation. So I appreciate it. Yeah, I mean, I, I really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I, I think like my work is pretty, it's kind of didactic in a lot of ways, because it's, it's, it's not, I, I mean, you know, if I wasn't sitting here explaining every symbol and everything that I did, maybe you wouldn't get that if you went there. And if you didn't know the meditation, but it, it, it is in a sense, and it, it doesn't always have to be like that. You know, it could be, I think if you're practicing any kind of spiritual practice or even meditating, it's sort of impossible. It doesn't collide, you know, it doesn't mix in with your work. Cause if my, I, I really connect to work that's like personal and not, you know, making art about art or a comment on not that there's anything wrong with that, but it, it's just personally, I really like that. <clears throat> and so that personal, you know, feeling based work it has to it has to connect with my spiritual practice otherwise you know i'm not doing something right but it doesn't always have to do that so if you're a painter and you know doing other things that's it's fine too but i do i do appreciate that thank you did a jai you have a question it's um it's jay uh, and it's it's a comment, and so I, I would like to start by thanking you for sharing and for naming that this comment is disattached from your art, which I really appreciate, and I also really appreciate and honor the um, reflection that it's personal, um, and that's what makes it feel deep and dived in for you. Um, some things that came up for me, and I think they came up for me uh, from hearing your conversation about Nina Simone's perspective on freedom um, and, and then thinking back about this process uh, or not thinking back, but going through this process of dying and thinking about the distance between, um, and this is my personal observation, the distance between how close death is every day for a, a black woman um, than it is for an, another person, his, like you know, um, statistically, and to engage in willingly dying so often, um, I haven't quite sat with how that yet feels in my body because I so often already need to think about the death and the process of death that I will engage in. And I have since childhood um, that to, the, to put myself through this process. Um, I, I'm also at a retreat this week. And one of the things that we did was a, um, a tongue a tongue where we also took in other people's suffering and I just think That's sometimes awesome. thank you and I think sometimes um even the way that it's received sometimes feels like it lacks this acknowledgement or this awareness um of the oppression that already kind of lives in the in the black body and so a part of me is still feeling um unsettled or un clarified or unsafe in this practice of of dying of allowing myself to die um because it actually doesn't feel like it aligns with my reality which is that i could die at any moment and there could be all of these things unveiled and so going through this process of like yes i have said my goodbyes i've given all of my things away that 
sort of visionary aspect of it kind of feels like an equal amount of painful just does not have um just my everyday thought to death um and how close it could be so i and i think maybe i got there or maybe i'm at that spot because you brought in you know someone who who has a very difficult and distinct path um as an oppressed black woman as an oppressed black woman with mental health issues at many times where her life was on the line because of her mental health um put herself through these this meditation um or, or is there a version of this meditation that is safer and more appropriate in in that way mm -hmm. is a little bit of where i'm living at, um, in in these moments sorry you're cutting you're cutting out a little bit say the last part one more time is there a what Hello, Jay. Um, can you hear me? I can, can hear you hear now. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think say the last part one more time. Is there a what? Can, can anyone hear them? Jay, I'm wondering if you want to just type your uh, finish typing what you wanted to say, because um, like Eric, I'm also having a hard time hearing you. I think I yeah. think I, I can try. Yeah, I think I think I understood the base of it. And I I I yeah, I really I, I hear you for sure. And I'm glad you connected with that because I mean, you know, the documentary is it's not like it's new, so it's not like the most modern example, but I I have a moment with Nina Simone like every week where I'll I'll listen to wild is the wind oh my god i cannot listen to that song without crying it whatever <clears throat> so i i really really i really really love her but um i've i've heard you know tong len tong len it's deep it's a deep powerful practice and that's what you know you i think you said you were doing tong len <clears throat> but you don't have to, you know, you, and it's like feeding, feeding your demons is another practice that like, I, I really, really love to do. And it's visualizing a demon, which is like anything that's blocking your energy, but it could be, you know, this deep, long lasting hatred relationship with your mother that is so deep rooted that it controls everything you do. Or it could be someone who was like, giving you a little bit of toot at the coffee shop this morning. You know, you don't have to start with this deep, deep thing. And that's this, I think the same with Tong Len is you're taking in the, uh, you know, kind you're, you're taking in other, other suffering. So you can start with like something that's lighter and it doesn't have to be this, like, you know, you don't have to be, you like the deep, it doesn't have to be that deep. It could be, you know, just something very light that you're taking on the suffering of someone who hate, doesn't like their job or, you know, whatever, whatever it is. And I think the same would apply to feeding your demons. I mean, to uh, the eight disillusions. Yeah. You're picturing your own death and that kind of is scary, but number one, you don't have to do this. If it's, if it's too much and you know, of course, it's it's not necessarily a thing that um, you have to go through. It may not be for everyone. And also, you can start in the beginning. I mean, you said you were able to go in the beginning and, you know, do the whole thing with getting ready to die, which is like your family and getting rid of your monetary stuff and all of that. You can start with that and then start with number one you know, and feel the, the earth elements start to go. If you really, you know, want to go through like learning and practicing this, <clears throat> start with the first element. And then if it gets too much, stop. And then, you know, figure out 
not figure out, but maybe investigate ways of what, what happened there, you know, like this came up. So how do I deal with that when that comes up again? And then go a little bit further and a little bit further and a little bit further. It doesn't really, um, it's less scary to think about dying because it's my everyday, so this process of crafting my dreams is ignorant of my dream. Yeah, I mean, I, I understand that. I, I understand that for sure. And maybe this isn't, maybe this isn't a practice that you need to do because it's too, it hits too close to home. Um, I know a lot of people that dealt with, had a lot of people around them die is, it's gonna be harder for them to do this. And it's gonna be harder for people for many different reasons. So if you really wanna, I would suggest doing the stuff in the beginning and then maybe going to number one and then you know slowly but surely do that. But don't think that it's a necessary practice for you at this time. And also, Eric, I just want to name that there's a question in the box as well. Oh yeah, I'll pop it in the chat again. But I don't want mean to interrupt you. Um, uh, but I see that Flor is asking, do you oh, no. recommend a text or audio for revisiting this meditation again? Yes, yes. I I was doing it the way I was doing it. I recorded myself doing it. And it was a little weird to hear myself because I kept critiquing. My, but there's there's a monk that uh, or a llama that I was listening to while I was doing it. So I can I can send that around. I'll dig that up and I, I could send it in an email to everyone. Along with someone, Andrew mentioned that the audio was off, the sound is off <clears throat> when I was playing the video and also it was low res. So I'll send that around as well. Is there anyone else that? It was, really, it was really powerful. Thank you. It was really, and the, the colors, I don't know why the, the red sky felt so, I don't know, very, very like dry, like powder and not in a sad way. I, I, I never thought it was a sad dying. It was like powdery, like material, body dying it was an exercise it, at least you, you you guided it so not not in a christian I, i'm a I, i'm not in a christian sad way it was an exercise good thank you i mean for me the the red sky was always the most visual i mean i got so much from that that it was always about textures. I mean, when I visioned these things, it was always about textures. And that's why I started making all that stuff is because the textures were so prominent. So it's number, the red one was always the most for me, for me too. But it's not supposed to be a sad thing, you know? It's not supposed to be, no. you know, like I'm dying kying of, it's just the, it's, a, it will happen to all of us. So it's, allowing it to happen and kind of seeing what happens, you know. Absolutely. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Sweet. Well, 8.30 right in the nose. Yeah. Thank you so much, Eric. We really appreciate you taking the time to come and talk about your work. Um, I have sent you the email addresses of everyone who attended so you can be in direct contact with them. What a powerful expression. And, you know, like Helen said, it's so amazing to see things like the, you know, kombucha scoobies being used. And it's just such a, a sort of a synthesis of everything your practice, your art, the music. Um, so definitely some alchemy involved in what you're doing as well, I would say. Thank, thank you, you so much. That. Oh my God, thank you. And thank you everyone for going through with this. It was cool. I'm, I'm very appreciative. And thank you Manaslu thank you. for flagging that Eric was doing this and suggesting I send a newsletter. Yeah, um, thank you so much cool. Manaslu. It's, it's yeah. good to see you too. All right, nice thank you. you. Good luck. Bye.
All right. Bye, guys. And go check out the show. Yes, definitely. <laughs> okay. Bye. Thank you.